Let's get going again. Um, so we're about 15 minutes behind. Um, don't feel the need to finish early, but it's. We can run into lunch. Yeah. Let's just start with the simple. So our next speaker is Julia Chan. Uh, spoken at the school uh, several times now. So thank you. Um, Julie is a chemist at uh, Baylor University. Talk to us about uh, strategy. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Nick and Efrain. I don't know. I don't think he's logging in from Germany, but. Um, I don't know our staff sitting in there. I've got that certainly so I need to get up. I'm glad you got a little break before I give my talk. Um, all right, I also welcome questions, so you know, feel free. Now I have to have a little disclaimer here. I can't really see you because I'm wearing my other pair of glasses. So long story. Okay. Uh, you just have to wait. Uh, so I recently moved like six months ago uh, to Baylor University on um, in Central Texas. So uh, my office, I think. It's staring at this. I think it's right there. And one of my labs is here. And my x ray lab is on the other side. No, I got it backwards. No, something like that. Just come visit us if you're ever stuck in Central Texas. It's a beautiful building. Um, so, throughout this talk, um, I plan to show single crystals of the materials that we make, we make in our lab. That's my job as an advisor. Um, but one thing I wanted to say, too, is that, you know, it is so nice to hear Brian say that we talk about synthesis again. I've always enjoyed it, listened to him numerous times. And of course, at Helena talking about phase diagrams. Um, so now that we have these tools to make materials, um, I think you know, the next question to ask is, you know, what are some of the strategies? You know, what do you want to make? Okay, so I would have to admit that as a crystal grower, it is very easy to put stuff in furnace and make materials, but there has to be some strategy. So that's my game plan for today. Um, so, but first I gotta acknowledge my former PhD students. Um, and JP talked about uh, jobs. So I just wanted to share this snapshot. Uh, I've graduated quite a few students and um, they all are happily employed, I'm pleased to say. Um, and they're, they're a good crew. So if you also have questions before I leave town, I also have some insights on that front. Um, so I always show this slide because at the end of the day, you know, uh, as a crystal grower, you have to sit around and think about why is it that, you know, the taxpayer should give you money to make material. I walk around saying that too. Um, aside from the fact that it is so exciting and satisfying, especially for a solid state scientist to be able to see highly fascinating single crystals. Um, and there are several um, documents that are available and some of you have seen it, and if you haven't, or you're not familiar with these documents, I'm happy to share them. Some of them are DOE related reports um, that we sat through the season. Um, and so, from our group, we even talked about, you know, um, we've written several review articles about how, what, how do you decide what to make um, an accounts paper and also a chemistry materials paper. Um, we quite enjoy uh, you know, sharing some of our insights when it comes to crystal growth. Um, so next, um, I don't have to tell you all, uh, naturally, uh, you all are excited about quantum materials and in some ways that's why we're here, but it's always really good to sit back, you know, and be able to articulate, you know, what are emergent materials? You know, what are the materials that you're excited about and why should we care? Um, so in my group in particular, we spend a lot of time working on highly correlated existing human years um, and even frustrated magnets and, you know, 
more recent time topological materials, and all of you are excited about that. Um, and there will be talks on two dimensional materials working in the program. And so certainly we're all excited about it. Um, by no means are we experts, okay? So it might be a bit of do all of it. I'm just saying that this is a great organization um, for school growers. Um, so I sit around thinking about, you know, what's, what's exciting in solid state chemistry and physics now? Um, partly because um, I, we all read a lot of literature and from what I see, you know, this is just a snapshot of a list of um, compounds um, that have all sorts of wonderful, exciting behavior. And um, at the end of the day, we do care about technological applications. And so, but, at the end, you know, but first step first, you have to have the material to make the, you know, to do the nice physical property measurement. And so hopefully this is um, somewhat of a um, motivation to do this. Um, I also care a lot about now which things matter or the things that are unusual um, rather than something that you could fit very nicely. Okay, I'll fit a plot, fit the data sets, for instance. Um, but anyway, uh, so now uh, the outline for today's talk, I'm going to talk about the methods and reaction conditions. So we already had a preview of this, but I'm going to actually show you how we work out to do this. Um, you know, we are, most of us are familiar with conventional growth of materials, for example, the simplest, most straightforward um, synthesis method is in fact a conventional method like heat and beat, you know, ceramic synthesis, which Helena talked about phase diagrams. And I would argue that, you know, especially in oxides, that's what people do. They, um, you know, show the ternary phase diagrams and so it is extremely um, intensive. I, still, I think I still have PTSD you know, for doing ternary phase diagrams on the post -doc at this. And people don't realize to make these tie lines I mean, boy, the number of samples, the number of times that you have to heat and beat to reach equilibrium. Okay. Um, but anyway, of course, you know, I've grown to love flexible synthesis um, as an as a, uh, investigator myself um, for the reason that we do make beautiful, oh, all of this like crystals. Okay. Um, but then what about structural inspiration? Okay. So we know how to make things. You know, what, you know, so what are the strategies? So I'm going to tell you how we get inspired to do this. And in a more recent time, we've been thinking a lot more about characterization. Um, and even, I think it was Brian Sales that showed that, you know, there are times when people make mistakes because, you know, they think that that's what they make, but is it really what, you know, what about the measurements aspect? So what about more advanced um, characterization techniques, for instance? Um, and so, you know, we, we love our crystallography, we love the fraction and that's a no-brainer there. Uh, or in more recent times, we have started to think about um, tracking the action profile, things like, um, you know, are we properly characterizing our materials? What about crystal inclusions, for instance? Um, so spectroscopic imaging techniques are extremely important. So how many of you have been to the gym and neurology museum? I think that's what it's called, uh, Smithsonian. Okay, some of you need to get out. Okay, <laughs> I hate to say it, you gotta get out. Look at the crystals that are at the museum. And there's even a whole display talking about crystal growth process. I love it. Okay, that's the best for me to be a little bit early, besides the fact that to recover from 2 a.m. arrival time, like some of you have. But anyway, but it was great because I saw um, a whole display on the inclusion, and that's something that's so important. Because you know, we talk about using flux. I mean, there would be so anyway, so that's that's something that we, we have started to well, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, so, okay, so when you think about synthesis, right, it was arc melting, ceramic methods, and precursor rounds, there's the hydrothermal synthesis, lots and lots of methods, okay. Uh, chemists have done crystal growth since antiquity. I think that's what, that's what chemists sit around doing. But the thing is, most chemists don't grow large things of crystals. Well, that makes challenge, or with the challenging aspect of forces measurements. Um, but I do want to say, though, that you do not absolutely need to have a big single crystal to do. And I think maybe there's a tutorial on measurements at some point this week, so you can you know, just be aware of that. But nonetheless, it is easier to put leads on, okay, or even to characterize materials uh, when you have single crystals. And we've heard about all these different techniques that you know, Brian so talked about. Um, certainly, um, you know, the book that you all got has a few for examples too, so definitely go back to that. Um, anyhow, I would say let's talk about what is a single crystal. Um, Naturally, we know we want them, okay? But what happens is, um, and all of you, I have to admit, and if you're one of those people, um, 
I can't help but to say that it's, you know how many times I've read POV papers in a table of contents in an abstract section? Um, some people were still the powder diffraction pattern, like anybody could really see the little plots of the fit, but there was still a blob of some single crystals. Single crystal. Um, no, that's not single crystal, I promise you, because it's an aggregate of single crystals. In fact, I've seen it, it looks like polycrystalline mess. I mean, I bet you if I put it on a diffractometer, I'm not sure I see nice procession images, but hope when the rains. So anyway, future reviewers. Yeah, that's that's important. All right. We're gonna we're gonna make you really um, you should come see me after uh, this talk. What I meant by that. All right, so polycrystalline powder, um, they're really I, I do want to say that yeah, we like single crystals, but there are times when there are applications where all poly crystalline materials are. Still critical and naturally preferred. Okay? So, depending on what you're trying to do. And of course, there's also an amorphous glass. And so, something that I've always, I, mean, I shouldn't say this is quite amorphous, but you know, I'm sure you've, heard, you've seen in a high entropy alloy system. That's becoming more exciting in certain areas, um, not just mechanical properties historically, but people are looking for superconductivity in these sorts of materials. So, high entropy alloys means a combination of a whole bunch of transition metals or something like that. And people have that that even with, um, I saw an article with five transition metal um, substitution on a same crystal graphic site. Okay, with the iron base um, material. Um, so anyway, I feel sorry for the graduate student or undergraduate who have to weigh out so many things. I mean, I need to be able to come in on that. So good record keeping is, is a key for that one. And then the next thing is, of course, thin film. Okay, so thin film, they're also in that, in that community you could also call that signal crystal. And okay? so you can make a thin film that is highly oriented. You can put it in kind of loud and really just at the factometer and orient the you know, grains. Okay, so I just want you to be aware of that. So now that we got all the known things now, we're ready to go. So, what are the factors that influence the reactions of solids? Okay, um, I would say that, you know what, it is so important to put details um, in a notebook. I'm not kidding. Um, I've had students try to reproduce certain things and can't do it. And really has to do with the humidity. Uh, you know, is it summer, is it fall? That all makes a big difference. So temperature, pressure, atmosphere, okay. Um, yeah, I know, I need to get one of those things. Um, and structural consider that consideration, that's, that's actually um, most critical, actually, I kept thinking about this. Um, you know, how do you know what to substitute you know, one element for another. That also can also, also affect um, the reaction of solids. What about the reaction of um, Surface of the precursors, for instance, um, is it large grains? Is it a mesh? Is it um, pieces, ingots? How do you cut them? All those details. That should be in the notebook also. And then, of course, the inclination of one phase within another, diffusion rate, and you know, we talked about. You know, phase diagrams, but also, you know, the temperature profile, ramp up, ramp down, how do you program? If you go on vacation, if you plan your flight being delayed, maybe you could just inhale it longer, you know, it's, you know, that, those things are important. Um, also, topotactic reaction, that means you have a phase, you could insert, um, for example, intercalate different ions. Um, defect concentration, those sorts of things are also, can also uh, affect reaction um, of uh, solids. And actually, reaction, I should say reactivity. Um, that's also very important. And surface structure, reactivity of different crystal planes and faces, those will become later, uh, more important later. But I did find a more recent article that I quite enjoyed, and um, McGuire, which is, I guess, it's the same group as the uh, Brian Sills group. I really quite enjoyed it because it's a practical for crystal growth of that walls layer materials. I know there's a whole section on this. Um, so this is a 2020 paper. Good read, um, fun read. So, um, and again, if you need any of these references later, I'm happy to share. Um, you know, but actually, practical in a space, crystal growth, and the world, no problem. Um, so, the strategy in my group, um, we talked about flux work before, uh, and I'm highlighting some of the elements that we work with and taking advantage of. Um, so, in my research group, we're not so concerned about, uh, you know, Parking ourselves in certain parts of the periodic table. In fact, some of my chemistry colleagues used to think it's a start awarding, but there has to be a strategy to this. But it turns out that you know we are taking advantage of the lower melting point of the main group element. And that's something that Helena talked about. You know, you have tin points that's up to 32. Okay, good. 
use that to resolve the transition at all, you know, higher melting point of um, the other elements. Um, we work with lanthanides, many different transition metals. Um, we don't we don't like to use elements that are um, toxic to our lives. Um, I'm like my graduate student, so um, so we, we try to be safe. Uh, the method has been reported in many many different references, but I think these are the seminal work that Paul Campbell's uh, you know film back paper. It, it's right. That's 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 the one I quite enjoy. Um, McCready Canisius and our group also published um, some in 2005 2006. I'm basically talking about the different main group elements and you know what you could make with the um, corresponding main group elements. Mm -hmm. um, that's also a lot of fun to read. Um, and then, of course, using this method, it works really well because um, we are using main group rich elements. I think I want to emphasize that. This, is, this method is great when you have main group rich elements. Um, and we've been able to make a whole bunch of different compounds. But at the same time, I also want you to be aware that you know, there are some chemical medium that is not necessarily a transition at all. It could be a salt. Um, and um, there's an editor in organic chemistry and I, we wrote an um, editorial highlighting several uh, investigators, young investigators primarily. Um, I, and I really like this, you know, the benefit of um, leaving your synthetic comfort zone. You know, and so for some people who are not doing synthesis all the time, it's like you have to always use a different recipe. And so uh, this, this editorial is actually has uh, about 30 papers and examples of um, different compounds you could go with uncommon media. So that's 2020 real reference. Um, now, uh -huh, yes. Can you give an example of what kind of uncommon media? So, um, instead, well, iodine is actually quite, um, quite common, but people have used different salts, different ionic liquids, for instance. Um, even um, basically low voltage um, cannot and ionic salts. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, and even different methods, too. So, uh, that's a good one. And really, the idea is that you know why should we think about common media in a sense that you know you want to lower the melting point so you have you know you have time for the crystals to grow. Okay, um, so I do want to share that you know there I am saying that we we're using molten salt and okay main group elements as a solution right at high temperature, but you know imagine if you're trying to make a compound like this, gather the new one seventeen cobalt fifty six tin. Uh, 112. The number sounds like bingo numbers, but it's really roughly two to point two or whatever. But what happens is, in this case, this is not a tin rich phase. And what happens is, if you put a lot of tin to try to make this, you end up making the 112 compound, the adalinium cobalt tin 2. Okay, so that's not any good. But it turns out that, you know, if you look at the phase diagram here, I have cobalt and gadolinium. Now, this is fascinating about phase diagrams. You always have to stare at it for a while. I mean, it's Think about it, gadolinium melts at 1262, right? Uh, cobalt melts at 1495. You combine those two things. Isn't it amazing that there's actually an effect at 645? I mean, think about it, right? Something so high. Um, so it turns out that the formula you know, for this material, uh, it's about 66, so we're supposed to 70%. And if you look at you know, the 70% deal, is in this region. Oh, that's very much accessible. So it turns out that we could grow single crystals that way too. So don't always look at that, you know, mango bridge, but look at the combination there. Um, and I think somebody also asked about turning these diagrams around talk. Um, for intermetallics, um, it's not like oxides, they're more expensive, right? So significantly more expensive. So you can't be messing around with millions of combinations. Um, but you know, thank goodness there's calculations and a lot of people have done a lot of phase diagrams that turn out. So just be aware that. Some techniques are good for certain compounds, but not all. That's the thing. All right. So, quite a few years ago, now, it's not, it's not that long ago, but we did publish a paper talking about that we should cast a wider net um, when it comes to making low dimensional materials. Um, we've worked with low dimensional materials for many years. I mean, since mid 2000s, we've been working with square net compounds, or maybe some low dimensional materials. Um, so, one of the things that we say, well, you know, is there a strategy to make a low dimensional material? Well, what kind of low dimensional material? There are plenty out there, in fact. Um, you know, it's been around, even Will Hoffman predicted, and even talked about structure and bonding of square nets. Um, you know, uh, good papers to read as well. Anyway, 
this all started, I'll tell you some history. This is on Korea. I decided to bring this up partly because this was the first square net compound that we inadvertently made. Okay, and I think that's just, that's what I was going to say. Inadvertently, <coughs> we were not, we were not, you know, wanting to make this space. We wanted to make some chlorides or something. We use antimony flux. Um, so it turns out that this is a square network. What got me interested in this uh, compound was the fact that you got square nets of antimony, you got lanthanum interspersed between it. Hold together by Van Holt's forces. And so this is a layer of materials that I thought, well, the experiment to do maybe you know, resistance. So that's what I meant by like showing sure you know, once you have a phase, you're like, well, well, what do you think you're gonna measure? Well, wouldn't it be neat to figure out if there's a large change in the resistance? Okay. So that's exactly what we did. We had we measured the resistance as a function of magnetic field, and in fact, um, you could see a change in the resistance, you know, maybe 500. Now that's unusual for inner metallic. Usually you don't see that. Um, probably uh, maybe a couple of percent, something like that. And we, we moved on since then. And we published this partly because it's, it's weird because you know at some point you know I mean, the resistance should not be linear the whole you know temperature range. That we, I mean, at that point I don't know why, but um, you know, it should saturate at some point. Um, but one of the things that we did was I was like, well, then I had a graduate student years later. He loved these sorts of systems, so. But the problem is with these lanthanide uh, and timonides, okay? And actually, Paul Campbell has published um, a whole bunch of lanthanide analogs, lots of great examples. But the problem is with lanthanide work, you know, most of the uh, order of temperatures are fairly low. So I had a graduate student who decided that, well, I'm gonna put a boatload of iron, okay? So then I mean, a boatload of iron, put this in, and it turns out that we were able to make this space. This is lanthanide, um, iron, and timonide. And part of the reason is because too that you know with the advent of you know discovery of superconductivity, I mean base superconductors, we thought wouldn't that be neat if there were other examples? And so that's that's motivation for iron too. Um, but it turns out that we have this um, you know two slab um, two you know lead oxide type um, uh, lab interspersed between the lead and the iron type. But another thing that was exciting was the fact that you know there's also triangular subunits. If we look closely, and we were at that time interested in magnetic frustration. So that's how we, you know, C1 structure is like, oh, can we make something else? Okay. Now, the way we do the synthesis is just like what we, you know, what, you know, what the flexible synthesis, we've seen it. Um, and I wanted to point out that, you know, we do think about how components of these elements, but one of the things that, you know, it's not easy to figure out a furnace, pretty neatly separated. And, you know, somebody asked, why are there two crucibles? So, that's why, um, again, it's repetition, so that's always good. You want to separate your flux from your, um, your plug to your liquid is flux from your single crystal. Now, um, but the problem is sometimes the flux that you use may not fit you the crystal size you want, okay? So it turns out that we always get these tiny crystals, 0.1, you know, a millimeter, 0.2, that's no fun. And sometimes we want to use another flux. So we've used this in flux, for example, which is the one seven. And it turns out that business and antimony does not have a large solubility. Um, so we took advantage of that. But it turned out that there's a little bit of solubility. And I think I wanted to point this out. And so even if you look at the phase diagram, there should not be any compounds or there's not, not solubility. Who knows when you add a third component? I think that's what I'm going to point, third component. Um, and this was actually a lot of fun, partly because, OK, well, it is true that we could use flux, but the container is also important. So for this particular reaction, we actually use iron too. Okay, we will make an iron, so we don't have to worry so much about iron impurities. That also works out really nicely. Um, now, going back to my treaties on, you know, uh, showing the powder the fraction pattern in some little blob of crystal, okay, at TLC, I would argue that, you know, not all of these are so pretty. I mean, at least, I would say this is nice. I mean, you could cut up these labels, but as soon as, as you all know, Soon, but you know, when you work with layered materials, as soon as you cut them, you're going to compromise the crystal mosaicity. Okay, um, mosaicity is simply a metric um, to talk about the crystal quality. Okay, sometimes physicists call it triple R, and in some ways, it's kind of the same idea. But mosaicity is a diffraction term that tells you really like, the quality mm -hmm. of your single crystal. Okay, it's in degrees, units of degrees, basically, how, how nicely are the grains on, you know, on top of each other. All right, so um, I would say that, you know, clearly low dimensional materials have, you know, you're going to hear about it. Um, 
lots of potential for interesting physics. Um, and I decided to list some of them that we've worked with. But if you look at these sets of compounds, uh, the crystal structure types have been reported. I mean, we're talking 30, 40 years, but yet no one has yet measured them until more recent days. And I think that's more, that's kind of exciting. So if you're really bored to, you know, flip through um, journal of solid state chemistry, <laughs> chemistry journal, how about if you have that crystal solid state chemistry? But anyway, just flip through it and then look for compounds. Just look at pictures. You don't need to read words. This is great. And then if you see little pictures, square nets or, you know, low dimensional materials, that's something that you can go after. And actually, there's a lot of exciting physics yet to be discovered. And in fact, I just did a quick literature search just to show you. These compounds have been around for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And look at that. I mean, Gobi magnet to topological materials, the back chromium, all those things. Okay. And so there's, it's like a gold mine. You know? um, anyway, this is not our work. I thought that was neat. A whole bunch of papers. Okay. With nature and science, nature of physics, physics. All right. Now, um, but in more recent days, though, it is exciting. Constant dichloride, or even the one we want structure type is chromium silicon, sulfur, a um, lot of square nets. And so, and I do want to point out too that I'm showing an equal atomic uh, formula, the 111. Oh, let me see, where's my cursor? Okay. The 111 is in the middle here. Can you see that? Now, there's a one to one to one formula, right? It's equal atomic. But there's so many crystal structure types. So this is because you have one mole of each of those elements and combining them, you really have to do the fraction well because um, just because that's what you put in, that doesn't mean that's what you get out. Either you arc melt or even flip tilt, that doesn't matter. Okay. So that's another this way too. Um, anyway, but I wanted to show you that you know these are the compounds, the structure types are known, but you know, so as materials folks, we can actually can really take advantage of those. You know, can we modify it? Can we tune it? You know, decorated, I would look at decoration. So, all right. So let me show you another example and of inspiration. So this is a three-dimensional gold copper three um, compound. Okay, 1998. I mean, that was just a long time ago, even before some of you were born. Anyway, but what really intrigued me for this phase, this whole family of compounds, is the fact that this is an antiferromagnetic applied pressure. Okay, and all of a sudden we have superconductivity. Okay, and then um, in a minute. Well, I guess early 2003 or so, we had actually made a whole bunch of analogs, um, you know, in collaboration with um, Los Angeles group, this, you know, the cerium transition metal can give the three input C. This is a homologous series that really got attention back in the early 20, the 2000, probably because of conventional superconductivity. I thought that was the eight. I mean, there are not that many examples. And um, then I was thinking, are there any other families of so that's the question I raised. It's great if somebody discovered it. You could, oh boy, you could go out of town with this. I mean, I told this day we still see papers in this field. Um, maybe not as much as mid 2000s. I don't know, but I still see it. So we actually, in, well, mid 2006, we decided to. Well, we were working with Danite at that point, and so one of my graduate students actually made this compound. And what intrigued me about this compound is the fact that this is a, in the first example of an intermetallic. Perovskite compound. There we go. That, that catchphrase. You know, you, you keep hearing about perovskite hybrid materials getting to be out of control, I guess. But anyway, um, I hope I'm able to put in my two cents worth about this as I'm giving my call. But anyway, uh, so we thought that was kind of neat. Um, and, you know, this is basically a triple perovskite. Now, one of the exciting things is, I mean, if you think about condensed matter, right? Uh, perovskite is exciting because. There's so many different polymorphs, different variations. You know, you can stack, okay? You can change the dimensionality that way. And I think that is an inspiration because the structure type is not that difficult. And the idea is that, you know, if you can make homologous series and you can stack it, for example, cooperates, okay? You know, the high TC superconductors are so many elements again, but, you know, they're highly dimensional. I mean, they're like all skinny compounds. I mean, it's, it's great, okay? Pictures are very important. So, so it turns out that this is something similar in the sense that you know we could describe this very simple ABX3 perovskite, you know, to something that's more complicated now than in the house. And it's a serium base. But what got me excited about this is the fact that serium now is in the same chemical environment as what we saw in the gold copper three, you know, the indites. Okay. Um, so that was exciting to us. 
And it turns out that this is one of the heavy electron systems, very exciting at that point um, during that time. Anyway, we put it away, you know, that happens, you know, student graduates move on. Um, then I was at a meeting, um, I saw Emilia Morrison, okay, um, and I can relate a little to Emilia Morrison, some, some history of who worked with whom. But um, so she had contacted us partly because if you look at this, this is the superconductor. Uh, this is resistivity as a function of temperature. Um, the odd part about the superconductivity is this is a metallic system that you would expect pre, you know, before it even merges into superconductivity. It's actually it's not metallic. That's unusual. But you know, the question is, is there a scientific reason why that is the case? Or is there a chemical reason why that is the case? And we did some literature search and found this compound. This is, this, again, it's isostructural. Um, so the idea was that, well, should we think about, you know, looking at the allegory details of these thermite? In fact, it was critical because, you know, so this is the single crystal X-ray diffraction image, the precession image, okay? This is the Latusium iridium germanite. You know, if you look at this, I don't know if it comes out clear, you can see the green spheres, okay? So in other words, you're indexing all the, uh, all the spots, right? But if you look ever so closely, there are, you know, these, that are not quite indexed. They're very light. Okay. So the thing is, the refinement, when you do the refinement, it looks beautiful, you know, great statistics, great art factors, you know, but that doesn't really tell the whole story, does it? So it turned out that, you know, if we use the space group, you know, BM3 bar N, which is common for oscillates, you can see that there are some reflections that are not quite indexed. And it's only with single crystal N powder data back and forth. One of my graduate students was able to solve this crystal structure. So very different. Okay. So the statistics, like I said, I mean from single crystal is like R R 2.5%. Great, you know, you know, you're done. But powder diffraction is important. So now this is tough because imagine you're telling a collaborator, um, we got a brand of your single crystal. Is that okay? <laughs> you have to spend all the time doing all these measurements. A oh, beautiful single crystal. Okay, we're going to book. So that's 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 the point I want to make. Okay, something to be right about um, to keep us on it. But anyway, it turns out that some of these analogs are actually significantly more complicated. But if you think about it, it's really just tripling of the unit cell, but with a little bit of symmetry in the space group. Um, maybe I should stop right here for a little bit. Are there any questions? There is no okay. All right, so then it turns out that with this formula, there are many, many different crystal structure types in you know, different space group. And uh, one of my graduate students, oh, question. Yeah, um, how is the interplay of powder and single crystal diffraction useful for determining structural modulation? Oh boy. Do you have to do that just with single crystal? Or? Yeah, okay, you just bring up a really good word, R, the M word, modulation. I don't like it. I actually, I wish I don't see them. Okay, I'm gonna be very honest. And because it's a pain, it's, it's very difficult. Okay, it's great. I'm so glad I can see that. Um, I, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, do you do modulated structures? Unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> but you know, there's so many really, really neat compounds that are modulated now. I and, yeah, and I, I'm fascinated with this too. And I have to admit, it is, I'd rather not see it, but now that we're better entry source, we are seeing some. And so we have to address it. But I would say that you could, uh, with modulated materials, uh, you could define a vector at least, you know, and this is this is a model, right? But when I, okay, you'll hear talks about DFT, and if you have friends and family who's going to do DFT for you, or maybe you could do it. But the reason, well, as soon as you have this order and modulated sites, it's computationally expensive. Um, and I wish I could find people that. I'm with you there. Um, can you, you, can help can you me? explain what you mean by modulated? Yeah, so modulated, for instance, um, you know, you have very nice diffraction peak in the precession image. So imagine um, you'll see these little weak spots, like super lattice reflection at some vector, at some direction, um, periodic. Okay, sometimes they're not periodic, sometimes they are. Okay, and you can actually define which direction. And um, I guess the most common software you can see if you read the literature. What, how does that translate to the structure? What, what, what is it in the structure of the um, It could be different direction of like, for example, let's say you have, it could be the main group element, 
that it's along a certain direction that it's modulated. So it's not periodic. Anymore. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good question. Anyway, so one of my graduate students decided to, you know, look at different models for this crystal structure type, and he actually 3D uh, print uh, some of the Baha'i features just to prove that, you know, it is in fact, you know, when you look at these crystal structures, there's distortion. Okay, the distortion about the polyhedral environment will tell you that, okay, yeah, maybe it's not the perfect cubic. Okay. Now, students, if you really want to get your advisor's attention, if you want to go on vacation, you do something like the, it's like subliminal message. You all right. Anyway, but this structure type, let me, I mean, this is an obnoxious slide. I tell people not to do this, but what I'm doing is just to demonstrate that, you know, here it is, a crystal structure type that is well known. Now there are more papers on it in the last five years. And actually, that's really nice on my end because, you know, we publish papers and then it's like, oh, does anybody really care? <laughs> but sometimes, you know, maybe the more advanced measurements. And it turns out that with these materials, um, the most exciting part is that this first of all, this is three dimensional material, and one would not expect charge density based this number. And now there's even non centric symmetric, um, you know, examples of these materials. So, um, should we think about charge density weight differently or chirality differently? Um, so, yeah, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Um, so then it gets me to go back to our original data in 2006, where we published the resistivity. Okay, I do not know how to, I don't know what to say about this, right? I mean, this is okay, maybe it's somewhat metallic -y, you know, above you know, 150, and then there's something happening, and then it goes up, and okay, maybe corresponding to some magnetic ordering. Um, resistivity looks something like this, the most bizarre thing. And it turns out that this compound, according to another group, that was published um, in 2015, I think. It shows, um, in fact, um, charge density. Question? Yeah, can you go back to the slide? Um, I noticed that uh, you have 3.13 at the bottom of your covered good materials, and then your good rev D paper where you decided to go. What leads you to decide to go into a specific site? Like in this case, you chose the transition metal. Why not the uh, lanthanide? Or the, uh, but, so the, we wanted to keep the valence of the terbium the same. And then, you know, the cobalt road and the iridium triad is the same. So what happens when you have a decreasing, you know, relative acidic type is what happens. That's one of the reasons. So, um, all right. So going back to this, check this out. I mean, this is, this is also a heavy electron system and coupled with the fact that now, you know, there's some anomaly um, in the resistivity. I mean, in peak capacity also. So then my latest kick is, should we look at compounds that we published before previously and think about, you know, we might have first order physical properties, but is there something different that we should consider? And actually there's another compound that we have published, it's gadolin with the tin phase. Um, so highly anisotropic. Well, first of all, this compound is extremely, co it's covalent. I mean, they're showing bonds within this lab. It is by no means a layer of material. It's a three-dimensional material, but yet, if you look at, you know, the physical properties, boy, they're highly anisotropic. I don't even know how to interpret this, but other than the fact that, you know, maybe we should really think about this. Um, in fact, you know, maybe sometimes it's a poor metal up to a certain, you know, temperature, and then it, something happens, and but the, at the point of this is three-dimensional material can also have uh, properties that are highly anisotropic, only possible with single crystals. And coming back to why we call single crystals. Right. And then um, okay, because we've been working on these stanite, it makes sense for us to go to germanite. And part of the reason is because if you think about germanite, right, that's more insulating than stanite. So we thought, well, okay, let's let's see if we can make some of the phases with germanite. Because we had published several papers with rare earth transition metals like cobalt family with the germanites. Well, the problem is those are all very small lanthanides. Okay, the latter block. And so can we make cerium compounds? I like cerium. I even have a in the cerium. Okay. Uh, so looking at the literature, there's it turns out that we could make um, some of the compounds that look like this, the cobalt germanite, cerium cobalt germanite. And then this one, this structure type is reported. So in a quest for trying to make single crystals, we got another touch in. Hey, that's, that's up there. Okay, scale is one millimeter. Um, but we ended up making something that looks like this. 
Oh my goodness. Okay, there are a lot of atoms here. Okay, we will not make friends to the calculations on this one. But to to grow larger crystals, increasing the yield. Um, we've got something that looks like this. Okay, think about the morphology again. Okay, they're plate like but this is more you know bulky. Okay, it turns out this is this compound. Okay, I I like layered materials. I like things that are highly anisotropic, but this is getting to be way too complicated. Lots of rare sites, okay? Um, and we have to increase the yield. That's a good idea when it comes to measurements, right? And it turns out to be uh, another analog, okay? So I just want, want to point out that we actually recently been successful in making some of these early analog. But uh, turns out that it's very difficult to make uh, the serum analog in cobalt Germany. So again, it has to do with size, okay? So yes, we could make some match and we could substitute, but sometimes you have to think about Atomic radii and should it fit? And what is the site preferences? Okay. And so, um, nonetheless, it's a lot of fun um, to characterize these materials on such a rare site. Who knows? But it does provide a very nice systematic way to look at sterium and transition metal and really, uh, you know, thinking about rare earth and deep block chemistry. Now, well, how do we go? Or how do we do this in increasing the yield? Okay, so one of the things that I was able to, we're very excited about this, is one of my graduate students, um, she got one of these fellowships uh, to spend time at Oregon um, at APS. So she was able to build a furnace and to do in situ um, x ray refraction. And so this furnace can actually go up to 1150. Okay, um, so what happens is um, as a function of temperature, you could like a lot of lots and lots of powder refraction to track what grows when. That's important because a lot we haven't talked about you know how do you yes we have phase diagrams to think about synthesis or at least give guidance. Okay, I think that's that's the key word is the guidance. But wouldn't it be neat to be able to track what phases actually form because then that way you could avoid some of the impurities. Because you know sometimes when you grow material there's always that impurity, but that's okay if you can separate them mechanically if you can visually um, you know separate them. So that's one of the things you did. So you could get the client. Yeah, anyway, you had a good time. And you know, so we're able to do all sorts of measurements in front of a new client now. So that's nice to be able to do that. But um, the problem is three months is a very short time. But now at least we do have a furnace that we can characterize. Okay. Um, and this is what this is just a model of what it looks like. But nonetheless, um, I do wanted to point out that when, whenever you do powder refraction. I would have to say that doing synchrotron work is a very humbling experience. Okay, it looks great when you're doing a power refraction pattern in the laboratory x ray unit, but actually, it's not bad. Okay, I don't want you to think that, oh, we got to do synchrotron. No, uh, it's, you know, that, that's not very practical. I mean, looking at the, you know, power diffraction data that you have in the lab very carefully and zoom in, it's critical. I think that's the first step. Okay, and so but we're able to do this. But still, there's sometimes there's this background thing, and it has to do with the fact that now we need tin flux to grow these materials. So, so there are certain challenges, that's another story. But nonetheless, the idea is that you can actually track reaction um, doing in situ work. Um, then the question is, what about lens, other lens? And I, so one of my other graduate students um, was able to spend some time at also um, at, uh, um, at APS doing these sorts of things. Um, and we worked out some of the kinks, you know, with respect to the background, for instance. And the compound I showed you in the last slide that was not known until uh, we knew that there was a member of the series based on a formula, but we just had not gotten it in a single crystal form at that point. And we, we were able to actually model it. And that's really neat. So it does give us an insight that, oh, yeah, well, wait a minute, there's some other things. Um, but nonetheless, that's a wonderful resource. I got to put a plug in for 11 BM, which is a theme line where you just write up. A proposal to um, ask for uh, mention and time. You fed up a sample and you get a thing. So that's a no brainer. That's, it doesn't cost you. Okay. Um, anyway, the only thing you have to do is to be able to put a long piece on your sample in a very, very thin capillary tube. So that requires some effort. But other than that, you know, that's not too bad. Um, and you, you just submit it. Um, and the data will be collected. So what do I think about future directions in the field? I mean, it is true that, you know, as an elementary chemist mostly, um, it is exciting, right? That you could play around with, you know, what are the 
experimental conditions um, to build different kinds of materials. Um, and sometimes, you know, you, you find phases that you unintendedly, I mean, it, it's not planned, but you should take advantage of it. You shouldn't say, oh, I know what I want. I'll just put it away. Go find a friend. Contact us. We'll be happy to think about it for you. But, um, and then that has led to wonderful collaboration, in fact. Um, anyway, but nonetheless, I mean, spend the time to, you know, characterize what you got. And I think, though, um, to move this field forward, you've got to have new shelter I strongly, strongly believe that. Um, and sometimes it's not, it's not the most, you know, you're, you're at the time, oh, I'm, I'm making this fake. Well, it looks like awfully complicated. Nobody really cares. And to some degree, no, but um, we still have to characterize. I mean, we just never know what to measure it. I think that's the take home message. Um, but, you know, what about structure types, structure adoption? You know, what is it about, you know, certain compounds that you could do this? And um, I truly believe that. You almost have to go back to your general chemistry textbook. I'm not kidding. Oh, so I do that. I don't know, looking at atomic radii, look at periodic trends, and even electronegativity. And that would help you decide is this something that can be made? And even before you go into the lab and try it. Okay, so there's some strategies toward that end. Um, these are just some of the crystals that have grown in the group, and there are a whole bunch more. But I think, isn't it neat though? I mean, you could almost uh, you know, look at this. Uh, one of my Thing is, I always want to know, you know, can we predict what crystal system is by looking at um, crystal morphology that way? Um, so that's also really neat. Okay, so I've shown you a whole bunch of compounds today, but but take home messages. Okay, we can look at the chemical environment, we could look at the dimensionality, right? And then we could think about, you know, should we go ahead and do the measurements? Um, but you have to have yield, okay? Um, these are just some of the compounds I decided to pick here. Um, and as a result of collaboration, actually, um, I met um, Basel um, at this meeting a couple of years ago, in fact, and that's how we started collaborating and that led to this niobium geranium too. Um, really neat, I mean, thinking about the chirality of materials. I mean, sometimes it's, it's very difficult. You can't tell by quality of fraction, but only with single crystals. And I think that was a fantastic thing. And we hope to um, continue to collaborate, okay? It's Boston College, and since then I've visited him and um, now, another thing is, too, uh, poor JP. I mean, I got these single crystals. Come on. I mean, what more can you ask for, right? Long needle. Can you please do it for us, please? please? Okay, I'll talk to her later. Okay, convince somebody that they should measure. And so that's another phase that we're very excited about. This is related to 166 compound. Everybody excited about it, the type of Kogomi business. But um, stepping back, though, there's so many different polymorphs. And this is actually a hybrid, it's not quite 166, it's actually tap 33 crystallographically, correct with um, the formula, but it's actually in between the cobalt tin and the 166 formula. There's a whole bunch of problems. What I'm trying to get at is, you know, um, sorry, we're really going to understand physics. I think it's important to know what space group we're talking about, which structural polymorph. Single crystals are neat, but I think discovery of synthesis precedes the application. That's critical. Okay. Um, so, but to discover, you have to look at new places, new base space, perhaps. Um, it is nice. We could keep making the same sort of materials and you can make some match, but you just never know. I mean, there are all these treasures that you have to look, okay? Um, but I saw this on Twitter, I just can't help it. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, sometimes, you know, you see some crystals and for that moment, you are the scientist. You know, I discovered this first and it is really satisfying. So definitely think big. Um, finally, I need to, you know, think my collaboration and my funding sources. Um, and I am a chemist, but I'm not a solid state chemist who loves convinced metaphysics. Okay, um, somewhat dangerous. Okay, but uh, I'm not afraid to admit I don't know everything, but I have a good friend. So I think that's that's the key, you know. And I think in this field in particular is critical. Okay, funding obviously. Um, Gotta have money to make materials and it cost. And so one of the things I do want to bring up cost is that we now instead of doing well with those books that this is right off the bat and carry case, I gotta think about lots of things. But we're also now doing a lot more DSCs and GAs, you know, thermal analysis to see if we could be more efficient and using less elements. 
Um, so there are challenges associated with that, but that's, that's a fantastic way to approach some of this as well. Um, and also, by the way, I met Ryan Bobov. He's not here, but he has three students that are here. Um, he also uh, has done some tutorial uh, for us. He said uh, he's going for rare earth I won't call him. But, um, but that, that's a wonderful collaboration, too. And he's been a great collaborator. I have to acknowledge that. And naturally, the high field night lab. I mean, that's, that's nice to be able to do measurements. Um, and I hope to send students there, too. And I think that's next step. Now, at the lunch, apparently, I looked at the schedule. You'll learn about low dimensional materials, uh, which is exciting. I look forward to that session. But really, what's next? I know it's not lasagna, <laughs> even though it's a layered material. But in fact, it's a three dimensional conglomeration of lunch. So we will find out. So, with that, thank you so much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> So I have four questions. I just have to say that uh, I think Julia should win the award for most creative uh, paper title. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, the proof is in the powder. I like that. Well, you know what? I have paper that I submitted. I'll tell you, reviewer number two did not like it. And I pulled it. And you know what? I said, you know what? I'm not publishing it. You know, we have to be exciting if you want. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. That's the okay. source of questions, okay. please. Well, you could ask me a question. I know you. Could you give us another um, uh, creative title? Sorry. Another so, creative title? Oh, and, uh, creative title. Yeah. Well, I mean, other fun titles. Yeah. Oh, and then I think that would be great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.